All right, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Richmond Art Gallery's November 2020 edition of the Artist Salon series. My name is Kathy Tykolis. I am the Education and Public Programs Coordinator for the Richmond Art Gallery, and I'll be your host tonight, moderating your questions. And tonight, our guest artist is Laura Kwok. Um, before we begin, I would like to welcome everyone from wherever you're joining in from home tonight. Um, but I would like to acknowledge that the Richmond Art Gallery is located on their traditional and ancestral territory of the Hunkaminam speaking peoples. This is the language spoken by Musqueam and many of the nations from the Fraser River Delta in BC. So we recognize the Indigenous peoples who have been dispossessed from their homelands and territories upon which our institution now um, resides and currently operates in. And we are very grateful for the opportunity to create, live and work in this land. I also want to thank you all out in the audience for joining in tonight, continuing to support the Richmond Art Gallery's programs. For those of you who are new to the Artist Salon, this is a monthly series of talks from February to November each year. We offer a mix of professional development and inspiration for artists just so you can keep on making your art. Um, the program does also exist as a Facebook group. Um, so this provides resources for artists, mainly in the Lower Mainland, um, with artist calls, professional development opportunities, local arts events, um, as well as a space for our local community to connect with one another. So you can find out more about our Facebook group, um, as well as viewing past sessions of the Artist Salon series on the Richmond Art Gallery website. Um, so tonight's talk uh, comes out of a chat I had with um, Richmond Public Art staff. And we were just kind of chatting about how artists that we work with um, are adapting and coping this year. And Laura's name came up as uh, someone who'd been selected for a community engagement project for 2020. Um, and then COVID happened. So how do you do a community engagement project when you have to follow COVID protocols of distancing, um, plus people not wanting to go out and get, be close together. Um, so it was you know, interesting to hear kind of how Laura had to adapt. And I know all of us are adapting this year to these big changes in our lives. Um, but I thought it'd be really interesting to hear from another artist who had a project in the works, like how do you adapt? How do you adapt that one thing that you'd already planned out? How does it change? Um, and just, um, yeah, thinking of ways we can keep moving on during this time. So I thought Laura was a great example of that, which is why I invited her tonight. I also thought she'd be a great person to offer all of us some tips on how to work with different clients, how to get your business started, um, and just how to um, get your work out there. And this would be applicable to artists, no matter what your medium is, but just how, how to keep going and how to adapt to 2020. Um, so to let you know a little bit more about Laura, Laura is a self-taught artist and illustrator from Richmond, BC. She launched her stationary brand and product line in 2016 called Art and Soul Creative Company. She also does commercial illustration work for clients and more recently working on mural projects. So tonight she will share some of her journey in developing her art career and offer tips on how to work with various clients and just how to get your work out there. So I want to thank you so much, Laura, for agreeing to do this tonight. Um, I will disappear into the background while Laura presents um, and we'll be monitoring your comments and questions in the chat. But meanwhile, thank you for being here, Laura, and you can take it away. Thanks, Kathy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am super excited to be doing this webinar. It's my very first one that I've ever done. And to be honest with you, I'm not really like technologically savvy. So this was kind of a learning curve for me, but um, I think that's with everything during this year. So um, thanks Kathy for that really nice introduction. And um, I'm just gonna go straight into my little um, slideshow here. Welcome to my little presentation here for the Richmond Art Gallery. I'm super excited to be doing this for you guys since um, I know I post a lot of pictures on Instagram, which is like the main thing I use um, to promote my art, but um, I haven't really had a chance to really sit down and talk about my art or go into detail about my process. So this will be a good um, 
good opportunity for that. All right, so if you're not really familiar with my work, I wanted to just show a few pictures, give a little bit of an introduction of what I do. Um, so one of the things I do is I create greeting cards for my company, Art and Soul Creative Co. And this is one example here. I also do art prints like this little whimsical bear. And I also have um, murals around the city as well, like this one here. And this is one of my newest pieces here. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail on these projects later, but I wanted to start out um, telling you how I got started with my art and kind of the journey behind um, my, basically my journey from, you know, being super lost in life to becoming a full-time artist, because that's a huge jump there. So um, this is a presentation that I've actually created a long time ago. And I created this part of the presentation for elementary school kids actually. Um, and it's kind of like an illustrated version of my story from childhood to now. But I felt like um, even though I made this with kids in mind, I feel like adults um, would enjoy it as well and need the same information. So this is me when I was young in illustrated form. <laughs> Basically, I was a very... Um, I guess I was a happy child who just loved to create and I would spend hours drawing by myself. Um, I guess I lived in an age where, you know, there weren't many toys back in the day or like computers or, you know, online things. So I would spend hours like playing with my brothers, creating tunnels out of cardboard boxes, going outside, um, like my parents would bring me to parks. So I had a really nice childhood where I would just make things and like, I spent a lot of time by myself drawing and I would just basically draw for hours and hours and not get bored. So that was me. And as I grew up though, for some reason, like when I became um, a teenager, I kind of stopped drawing and I'm not really sure why I've often asked myself that, but I kind of, went into a period of stagnation where I didn't really produce a lot. I think I was just more interested in different things. Um, and yeah, art kind of took a back seat for a while. And the last um, formal education I had was grade eight art. And after that, I think I did other things, but basically I stopped creating for a while. <laughs> And this is the next stage of my life, which is my university years. I actually went into university and studied um, English literature and also got a degree in education. So that was like six years of schooling. Um, and during those years, um, I felt like I was a little bit lost, not really sure what to do, didn't really have a career in mind, didn't wasn't really drawing except for during lectures when it was really, really boring, I would just start doodling. And my, univers my university friends know this, like I would just be on the side drawing my own things. For example, like a large burger terrorizing a village of vegetables. That was one of my main common drawings that reoccurred a lot. And um, yeah, I just, wasn't really happy with my life and didn't really know where to go from there. So I graduated from um, education and the year right after I um, happened to go to Hong Kong for a family vacation. And this was just supposed to be a one month trip where I was going to a relative's wedding um, and somehow when I got there, um, I got a job um, teaching English to high schoolers, which was super, super random, but I, I definitely didn't go into that trip thinking I was going to stay there. 
Um, I only had a suitcase full of like one month's, you know, uh, like worth of clothes. Um, and then I decided to just stay there for a year and teach English. And that was a really, really amazing adventure. Um, and it was really crazy um, stressful too though, because the education system in Hong Kong is super different from here. Canada is like much more relaxed and there's just a different vibe there. Hong Kong was super intense. And for someone who was just used to being like kind of lazy and relaxed, like it was a lot of work. Um, and also the school I was teaching at, there was no curriculum. So I was just basically making lesson plans the night before I was teaching. So it was kind of intense. Um, and during that year, I let out a lot of my like frustrations through art and creativity. And when I went home after a long, long day of work, um, sometimes like a 14 hour day of just like marking papers and, you know, um, teaching hundreds of students, I would draw and it was kind of like, you know, very therapeutic for me. And that was the one year that kind of became a catalyst for, um, my passion in art and I realized that art was really what I was into. And so after that year, I had gained like 10 pounds because I'd been eating like, you know, really crazily and just super stressed out. Um, but overall, it was a good learning experience and a good life experience. Um, and I came back to Canada and that year in Hong Kong really gave me the confidence actually to just completely do something different um, because I had been teaching for a really long time even before um, doing my education degree. I had been tutoring and like working odd jobs mostly with kids, um, working with kids with special needs. So working with children was very natural for me because um, I'm kind of like a big kid at heart anyways. Um, and so when I came back to Canada, I felt like I wanted to do something with kids, but also with my art. Um, and it was kind of tough for me because I didn't really know like what kind of company would give me a job related to art because I had no art education. Um, but I just looked online and found a studio called 4Cat Studio. You guys might have heard of it. It's a franchise. And basically I got the job ironically because I was a teacher and they wanted someone with an education background to teach kids how to draw. So um, I basically worked there for two years and those two years were really fundamental in um, helping me grow as an artist as well because I'd be teaching during the day and then I would be painting at night. And, like I'd be painting until like three or 4 a.m. sometimes just because I was so passionate about it. And I, I wasn't really posting this stuff. I was just creating for the sake of creating and just um, creating for myself too, drawing things that I wanted to draw um, instead of like the stuff I would teach during the day. So it was kind of like a very interesting lifestyle for those two years because I'd be like um, painting and drawing during the day for other people. And then at night I would be painting and drawing for myself. And that's when I really realized that um, I really enjoyed art and wanted to possibly make a career out of it. So I started thinking and I really didn't know where to start on how to build an art career. Growing up, I didn't really know that many artists or people who were really into art, I guess. Um, and I'd never thought of it as a career option before. But um, basically I quit my job and decided that I wanted to take four months off just to like make art and see where it goes. And I really didn't have any business plan. I didn't have anything um, that I was thinking of doing or any goals really, but I just kind of like saved money and decided to set those four months aside to see what I could do. And I told myself that after those four months, if I couldn't really make a living in art or like 
you know, I was just experimenting at that point, then I would go and find a new job. So I'm really glad I did that though, because that was like the big step I took to really make art um, my main focus. And there was basically my plan A and there was no plan B. I just kind of like took that risk. And um, I'm, I've never looked back since. So um, the first thing I did was I tried to think of a company name and I came up with Art and Soul, which is, you know, it's a pun, but also it's just very like, all my art is from my heart and soul. So it's just putting it out, putting it out into the world and um, seeing how it goes. So it kind of became, it was very like natural and organic the way it came about. And then from there, I don't know why I started doing this, but I started making like little characters, like this little mushroom guy, his name is Mortimer. <laughs> I started naming all my characters and I started putting puns to them, just things that I would think up. And um, usually I would think of these at like three or 4 a.m. in the morning and I would jot them down and I would create little characters to go with the puns. And um, during this time, I also started um, an Instagram for my art. And I just started, you know, posting things that I was making, things that excited me and, um, yeah, just different illustrations that I was creating. So here's another one that eventually turned into a greeting card. And this one here. And so, yeah, that was kind of the start of my art journey from childhood to now. And you can see this is adult Laura and she's just as happy as childhood Laura. <laughs> so it kind of came full circle. All right. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about how my business works and um, show you a little bit about, um, yeah, what I do day to day. So as I said before, greeting cards was kind of where I started um, just because it was easy to get things printed on paper I could make lots of different designs. And during this time, I was still um, kind of trying to uh, develop a style. So I felt like greeting cards was like a very easy way to get started because it wasn't a lot of risk. It wasn't like, you know, printing an image on like clothing and having to like stock different sizes, like from extra small to like extra large and having a lot of stock um, lying around. How I started was basically I would start posting images on Instagram of these cards that I made. And then um, when people ordered, I found a local printer who could print them really quickly. And then I just started printing them as people were ordering. Um, so that's how I got started. And of course, as you know, the company grew, I found more like cohesive and efficient ways to do things. But I mean, I just kind of put it out there at the beginning to see if there was any interest first before, you know, investing a whole lot of money into like something that might not even work. Um, so yeah, I just put together these bullet points, kind of things that I thought of when I first started my greeting card collection. Um, so the first thing I thought of was the type of product that I wanted to sell. And I wanted to have something that people could share with others. And that's why I kind of chose greeting cards and art prints. Um, and they were like happy little illustrations that people can either keep for themselves or share with their friends and family. So that was kind of the purpose as well. Um, and the target audience, um, that's something to think about if you are thinking of creating a product as well, of course. Um, for me, it was a little, it was kind of universal. I kind of wanted to make my cards gender neutral and appealing to many people, not just like one niche audience. So that's something to think about um, if you're thinking of getting into creating something for others, whether you wanna make it super niche and very specific to a certain type of person or kind of try to appeal to like a bunch of people. Um, of course, I researched into like profit margins to make sure that you know, it was profitable for me and I wasn't just like losing money. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I looked into sustainable options. So all my cards um, and packaging and everything are locally produced. And it's always been that way. And that's something I stand by. So um, yeah. And then the last thing is promotion, which is um, I basically for my company anyways, I would start posting on Instagram, like I mentioned. And um, I think in that way, it kind of organically grew. Um, so if you're interested, I kind of put together a list of different places that I started out selling at and also things that you can look into as well. So the first one is Etsy. That's where I first started um, posting my cards for sale. And I think at the beginning it was helpful because um, it generated a lot of traffic that I probably wouldn't have had if I was just starting with my own website. So at the beginning it was nice because, you know, on Etsy, you can put like different tags onto your products to make them, you know, show up better on the website. And that's what I started out with. Society6 and Redbubble are two other um, companies that I kind of dabbled around with, um, but they do take a big like cut of your uh, profit margin. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if I would exactly recommend them. <laughs> Um, I didn't really use them that much, but they're something that you could look into. Um, yeah, because it's quite, it's quite low commitment. So if you're just starting out, it might be a good way to get in there. Um, Society6, basically, you just need to like upload a design and then it can go on like all different things like mugs, t-shirts and things like that. So it might be a good way to just like gauge um, interest in your product or in your illustrations. And then local boutiques and gift shops was another avenue that was super helpful for me. Um, in Vancouver, Bird on a Wire Creations was the first shop that stocked some of my cards. And so I'm forever grateful to them. <laughs> and they really support local artists. There's a bunch of different shops in Vancouver who sell like local goods and handmade things. So if you're interested in selling, you know, your art and illustrations, I would definitely look into that and research places that, um, you know, support local artists. Giving Gifts was another shop that I first started out with. And um, one thing to think about is consignment or wholesale. So I actually do both. And I feel like both of them have good advantages. Wholesale is basically when you, um, sell to the shop outright and they pay you up front and whatever they sell, they keep the profit, but at least you get the lump sum right at the beginning. Um, and consignment is you give them the stock. Um, so basically, uh, like in my case, I would give the cards to the shop and whatever they sell, they would take a, a portion of the profit and I would take a portion of the profit. So um, it really depends, but um, I found wholesale is what I usually do. And there are certain consignment shops that are, um, that are good as well. Because if you do sell a lot in a shop, um, it's helpful for consignment because then you can just keep restocking them like really quickly and just, you know, keep selling. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> the next um, avenue that I used, and this is kind of before the pandemic, of course, um, is local art markets and craft shows. So these were super helpful in begin the beginning of building my business because it really got my stuff out there to um, the public and to people locally in Vancouver. So some of the markets that I participated in, starting from the left, top left, was the Etsy Vancouver market. And then Got Craft Market is the one in the middle there. And then the top right one, that is a picture from the Vancouver Make It Show. And the one on the bottom, lastly, is um, the one of a kind show in Toronto. So as you can see, you can probably notice that in the pictures, my booth changes a lot. And like it started out just like as a table with a tablecloth on top. 
and I kept it pretty minimal. Um, and you can see with the one of a kind show, the Toronto one is like super, looks more legit. <laughs> and it's, um, yeah, like basically you can, I wanted to show these pictures because um, you can see how like I slowly built, you know, better stuff for my presentation and just, it wasn't like overnight that I suddenly went to Toronto to the one of a kind show to sell my things. I started out local and started out small and with every um, show I did, I built, you know, uh, better displays and like, I, you know, with experience, you just get better and better through time. So these shows were really helpful in the first few years to um, just get people, um, yeah, just get people excited about my product. And it's really like, I, I enjoyed going to those shows to really meet my customers in person. Um, Cause I think there's a huge value in seeing people face to face and having them see your illustrations face to face is so much different from buying online. And obviously right now is not the best time to do that, but um, we'll get to that later. <laughs> And the last avenue that I used was my own website. So I mentioned before that um, I started out with Etsy, but after a while I felt like um, I wanted to control a little bit more about how my website was built and have more functionality to how people could navigate, you know, a website to buy my things. So I decided to start my own website and basically design one. Um, I'm not tech savvy, so I got um, someone who is a web designer to build it for me. But here are just three different options for building websites that um, I know a lot of artists use. A lot of my friends use Shopify, which is helpful because they already have like a built-in system to sell your things. Squarespace has really nice um, basic templates as well to start out with. And the one I use is WooCommerce, um, which is like an add-in or plug-in for um, WordPress. And so I basically um, got my web designer to um, build this website for me. And I'm telling you this because I think one of the ways that really helped me streamline my business was building this website and putting that top right link there, the wholesale page. Um, because before when people, when, when people wanted to um, purchase my cards, they would have to go on Etsy or like contact me through email. And it just became really confusing with all the different shops um, with, you know, like everyone had a different way of doing things. And all the companies would be, you know, invoicing in different ways as well. So what I did was I created a wholesale section on my website and that way um, all my wholesalers have an account with me and they can just buy straight off the website just like any online, you know, uh, online site. And it makes things super easy, super streamlined and the invoices are created like already in there. So I don't have to like, do anything. <laughs> so that is a little tip for just streamlining and making things easier. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about that, you can think about it and ask me because I'm happy to help. But um, yeah. Um, so other avenues to look into and that I also um, do are illustrations for companies. Uh, which is contract work and illustration royalties. So the one on the right is the little sushi swaddle is one that I, I designed for a company called Lulu Lollipop, which is also a local uh, baby brand in Vancouver. And um, so sometimes I do work for companies and that's part of where my business goes as well, aside from the cards. Um, and the contract work is just, you know, like, they'll come to me and be like, okay, design a swaddle with a sushi print 
or I've done for them like a taco print and a pizza print. And so these are fun projects that um, don't take too long and um, just keeps my business running as well. And then illustration royalties, I wanted to add really quickly. Um, there's this company that I designed for called Lake and they are an online digital coloring app. And basically I have a contract with them to design black and white illustrations that people can color online, which is super cool. And I really lucked out with this company because I started with them from day one when they were building the app. And um, so I get a little bit of royalties from them every month too, which is super nice. Basically what I'm trying to say is all these little things, little projects combine together to make it so that I can be a full-time artist. I know a lot of full-time people um, concentrate on like maybe just one thing, um, which is totally fine. Like I know a lot of super successful artists who just do original paintings or just do illustration work for companies or graphic design. Um, but for me, I think just because with my personality, I get a little bored if it's like the same thing. Like, to be honest, if I was just doing greeting cards, um, I think I would, yeah, just not be so into it. Um, so for me, I like the variety and I like diversifying and putting eggs in different baskets. So, yeah. Um, so basically I started with the greeting cards and the commissions and different projects. And that kind of helped me fund um, time, I guess, to create murals. Cause at the beginning, um, I didn't really think I was going to go into murals. It was something that kind of happened. Um, but because I had kind of like income coming in from the cards and different projects, I was able to focus some of my time into passion projects, which were the murals. So my very first mural um, was this one here. And it's so funny looking at old work because it's like, oh my God, it looks so weird. But um, <laughs> this was for a daycare. And it just so happened that it was like a friend of a friend who was starting a new daycare and she had a childhood monkey toy called Chi and she wanted to start a daycare called Chi in a tree. And so that's like the little monkey logo at the bottom there. And she just had a blank wall that she wanted to have a mural on. So um, this was a really good learning experience because it was my very first one. I really didn't know what I was doing, but it kind of gave me you know, the start of, you know, experience to really start looking into doing murals. Because after you do your first one, you're like, oh, okay, this is doable. <laughs> um, so for this one, I think I used, I started trying to use a projector, which is a tool that a lot of muralists use. Um, but I think halfway through, I, kind of stopped using it because it was kind of annoying. So um, I ended up freehanding most of it, I think. Um, my second mural was for a contest actually um, from the shop that I mentioned earlier called Giving Gifts. They put out an open call in Vancouver for submissions, design submissions for a wall um, that was outside their store. And they wanted to have like a mural that um, I think the theme was like being a dreamer. Um, and so I created this dreamer girl and it's called Flowers in Her Hair. And that was my very first outdoor mural. So that's my family there. <laughs> that's my aunt beside me and my dad and my mom. Um, I thought they would like that if I put that in there. <laughs> and also just to show that you know, behind all the art, there are just so many people supporting me and encouraging me along the way. And as you can see, bottom right, those are some of my friends who came and helped with this project as well. And so this project really gave me the confidence to, to start applying for different public art calls. 
Um, Cause before this, I didn't really know how that even worked, but this was my very first um, outdoor public project. So that was the finished product. Again, so weird looking at old work. <laughs> um, so with murals, yeah, I, I mentioned, I kind of fell into it organically. Um, and the more murals I did, the more work I started getting just from, you know, posting the projects. And I feel like, yeah, one thing that you can try to do is reach out to people if you're just starting out. So business owners, for example, coffee shops, restaurants and boutiques, um, if you're out and about and you see a wall that like you might want to have a mural on or like you have an idea for something like you could totally just, you know, start a conversation. Um, interior designers also um, sometimes need murals and I've worked with a couple. So um, that's another type of person to reach out to possibly. Um, and I mean, homeowners, you can start out with, you know, reaching out to your friends and family if you are interested in doing murals, um, because I'm sure, you know, um, I'm not saying do work for free, but like everyone has to start somewhere. And um, yeah, having friends and family who have like a wall for you to experiment on, like that's so great. I mean, I, I would still do that. <laughs> Um, okay, and then the last one is Vancouver Mural Festival, um, which is just one example of like a company in Vancouver that you can reach out to because I know you can become a volunteer and that way you can work on different projects with experienced mural artists. And that way you can just kind of like get your foot in there and learn from people who are like super, super good. So. Um, here are some examples of just some of the work that I've done in the past. So um, I used to think that I didn't really have much of a style or I was kind of like all over the place, like super random. <laughs> but I've learned to kind of embrace that as one of my strengths. And I've realized that uh, my work can be very versatile. So. I, I used to think that I was just not focused enough, but um, looking back at my past work, I realized like, you know, the one on the top or the top left, that one was for a restaurant. And the one on the bottom right, that one was for a fitness center or gym. So murals are super, um, yeah, they're, they're super cool that way in, in that you can get jobs in like many different facilities and, many different um, areas. The forest one down below, that one was for a private home in Whistler. Same with the one up top. That one was for the same home, actually. It was like a little children's rock climbing wall that they installed rocks on after I painted the geometric mountains there. So yeah, I would say the more murals I did, the more people saw my work, then, you know, the more projects you get. And one thing I really wanted to um, mention was you should add your own personality to your work for sure. So this is an example of that. Um, it was a mural where an interior designer asked me to design something for a dog wash station in a condo unit in Vancouver. And so this was a um, multi-mural project where this one, um, yeah, it was supposed to be a dog wash station. You see that teal door there that leads into this room where you can like, there's a huge like shower and a bathtub to like wash your pets, which is super cool. Like I didn't even know that condos have that, but this one does. Um, and so I decided to do a raining cats and dogs theme. And um, as I was painting, I would see like dogs walking out of the building with um, their owners. So halfway through the project, I actually decided to just like change my um, design and change the, the dogs and cats that I had um, illustrated in the initial concept. 
and I decided to model the animals off of like residence dogs. So I started taking pictures of the dogs walking by um, in the condo building every day. And I think it just added a little bit more of a personal touch to the project because it's like the people who live in the building who actually use the space and you know live there every day, go in and out, they get to see their pets on the wall. So <laughs> also because I wanted to just put cute pets up for you guys to see. Um, but yeah, the, the dog on the top left, just a little random note there, her name is Lila and she's a one-eyed dog and that's why I painted her as a pirate. She was like the cutest. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about applying for artist calls. Um, Cause there's a lot of artist opportunities out there. You just kind of have to like research and look for them. So I just wanted to reiterate that, um, yeah, I, you, I kind of like used the money that I got from like um, the greeting cards side of things and like selling art prints to, to buy myself time basically to, to um, apply to these artist calls. Because obviously when you apply to artist calls, it's, you know, it takes time. Um, sometimes the applications are really long and so, yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to get at there, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, the city artist calls, um, you can go on the Vancouver or Richmond or um, city websites and they'll usually have a section um, where they have opportunities for artists to apply to. Um, artist residencies and grants um, are another avenue. I honestly haven't looked into these a lot, but I thought I would put that up there because that's definitely an area where there, there are opportunities. And the last one is local art forums or groups. A lot of the time there are like groups for artists where they'll post um, different jobs. And one of them is Thrive, which is a women's group that meets every month. And I used to be a part of that um, group. And it was nice um, because you get to talk to different artists and see how people, other people do things because everyone's you know, journeys and art practices are different. So it's nice to be able to chat with people um, with similar mindsets, I guess, and uh, learn from each other as well. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about artist calls and this one project that I did a few years ago, which is still one of my favorite projects just because it was so meaningful and like I was just so honored to be a part of it. Um, so this was early on in my art career. I think it was like maybe three or four years ago. And um, I saw there was an artist call for the BC Children's Hospital um, and they were looking for mural artists. And I think back then I had only done like maybe three or four murals, like not even that many. And I really didn't think I was gonna get it because the, the application was like super long. It was like, um, show 20 past works and like write a whole essay and like explain why you want this opportunity and all this stuff. But um, yeah, basically I um, put together as many like past artworks that I could that were like super whimsical and um, childlike because that's kind of what they were looking for. And so when you're applying for artist calls, I would say like, think about what uh, kind of style or what, um, what the client is looking for so that you can kind of like pick and choose your um, artwork to go, you know, streamline towards that artist call. Um, so this one was, since it was one of my earlier projects, I was doing everything like by hand. So I really could have done this digitally, but back then I didn't really know how. So I basically bought these like MDF panels and painted everything by hand. And then, and then they digitized it for me afterwards. So I was in charge of illustrating three um, operation suites. 
And so I did like an Arctic animals theme. I did like a dinosaurs one because who doesn't love dinosaurs? And I also did a West Coast one, which is that one on the floor there. Um, and so when you're working with clients, again, like I was saying, um, you wanna really um, focus or highlight what they want. And so with this, they wanted something that was patterned and basically a pattern that could be replicated all along the walls, almost like wallpaper. And they wanted it to be, you know, cheerful and hopeful because this was going to be for the hospital where kids are, you know, of course they're, in, they're anxious and they're scared and they don't know what's going on. So I decided to create, you know, a calming color palette with soothing, peaceful colors so that when kids saw it, they'd be happy and they would, um, yeah, not be so scared. So those were the final digital proofs. And then this was kind of like the final product. And um, because this was a hospital, they had to install everything um, with a special type of, I think it was kind of like a vinyl almost. So um, this was different from, you know, murals where I would usually go and hand paint everything in the actual space. This one, I hand painted those panels, it got digitized and um, people installed the vinyl onto the walls. So it was really cool. I remember to go to the hospital and actually see these in person and see the work just, you know, put up there in the final state. Definitely a super memorable project. Okay. The next thing I wanted to talk about is um, when you get rejected. Because <laughs> I think that's something that people don't really want to talk about, but I think it's really important to learn from failures. So I made a little acronym for you guys. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on this because I think um, when you're putting your art out there, at least for me, like you, you don't really know like how people are gonna take it. And um, you know, it's not like I get every single artist call that I apply for. So when I do get you know, rejected or not chosen for something, first thing I do is reflect on reasons why the work might not have been chosen. And then I usually ask for feedback or info on the decision process. Um, so I've done this in the past where like I've actually applied to like, for example, the city of Richmond would have an artist call for a mural and then I wouldn't get chosen. So I would ask for feedback um, from the organizers and see how I can improve and, you know, try to glean some information on why I didn't get chosen. And a lot of the time I realized that um, it was maybe because my portfolio wasn't strong enough at the time when I was first starting out, you know, like people need to see the past works and need to know like that you can do things. So the last thing is make specific goals to improve your work. So for example, the thing I just mentioned where I said, um, I felt like my work or my portfolio wasn't strong enough. Then I started, you know, in my own time making pieces that I felt like were stronger. And so the next thing is try again. <laughs> Um, so this mural here is actually one example of a, um, something that I applied for a few times and didn't get it until this past year. So for the Vancouver Mural Festival, I had applied in the past and same thing. I felt like my portfolio wasn't really that strong in my mind. And this year, I finally felt like I had done enough murals and gotten enough experience to get to a place where I was confident with my work. Um, and I'm really glad that it happened that way um, because I feel like with this project, this was my biggest wall yet. And I feel like if I had applied in past years and had gotten it, I probably wouldn't have been prepared for the scale of this project. So I feel like everything, you know, happens in its own time and 
um, this kind of worked out that way. So this was a huge wall that was behind Strathcona Beer Company. And this was a project that I worked really, really hard on and was one of my favorite pieces from this year. It's called Late Bloomer. And it just kind of goes through my process or my progress as an artist going from, you know, greeting cards to large scale murals. Like, yeah, it's not overnight. It's definitely a lot of hard work and years of just like, um, you know, different goals and slowly step-by-step step, getting bigger and bigger projects. And that is my best friend, Nita, on the right. She definitely helped me with this project, was my assistant painter. And this is a final view from the rooftop of the, um, the building beside. Couple other things that I wanted to cover um, so I get a lot of questions asking like, um, about Instagram and how I make that work because it is the one social media avenue that I use the most. It's actually like my only social media thing. Um, so I would say like the most important thing is make creative things or content that makes you excited. So if you're not even excited about what you're posting or you're just doing it just because, like that doesn't really work. I feel like um, what's worked for me is just being true to like what I like and just posting whatever and whenever, like what gets me excited. And I think that shows. Um, the second thing is, try to get the attention of companies you want to work with on social media. Um, so that's why I brought up that Starbucks cup thing because um, that was something that a couple years ago, I just kind of randomly did on a whim. I just, it was like a red Starbucks cup that was completely blank. I don't know if you guys remember this, this was maybe like two or three years ago. And I was like, hey, that is such a opportunity to like, use white gel pen and like draw something on it. So I just did that in my spare time because I wanted to just for fun. And I posted it on social media and it actually um, got the attention of Starbucks and um, they bought that cup from me. <laughs> so, and they ended up using it in a commercial, I think. Um, so yeah, that's just one example of how if you're excited about what you're doing and you have a good idea that you're excited about, then just do it. And you know, you might get some opportunities that you might not have gotten before. Um, another thing is you can make murals or product mock-ups for fun. So I'm not saying do work for free, but again, if you have spare time and this is something you actually wanna do, you can um, use like an iPad or like a software where you can like, you know, upload a photograph and then draw on top of the photograph with a mural design that you have in your mind. And that way it's like, you're not making the actual mural, but um, you're just kind of showing what you can do. And the last thing is notice what connects with people. Um, that's a big one because you want your artwork to be representative of you, but you also want it to be making connections with people and, you know, make it interesting. Um, okay, so the last one of the, or not last thing, but one of, yeah, one of the most um, recent projects that I did was for the city of Richmond. Um, and this kind of goes into what Kathy was mentioning before about um, a project that was started before COVID and got postponed because of COVID and was completed during this pandemic and how it kind of evolved and changed throughout the process. So um, <clears throat> I got this job last year from the city of Richmond and it was again an artist call that I had applied to and this time I felt like my my portfolio was really strong because um, at this point I had done the late bloomer Vancouver mural festival mural. I'd done a bunch of other murals 
or yeah, um, I, I'd had a lot of um, previous work that I felt proud of. And so when I submitted this, um, I was pretty confident that um, I might get the opportunity. So this one was for West Richmond Community Center where they wanted a mural that was like super flowing and vibrant because there's a park nearby that a lot of people frequent. Um, there's kids, there's a high school right beside the building. There's like seniors um, who go to the community center for programs. So basically people of all ages and lots of people in the community use this space. Um, and at the beginning, um, before the pandemic, it was supposed to be um, two public engagement events where I would, you know, meet with people from the community and get their, um, get their opinions and their feedback on what they might want in the mural. It was supposed to be, you know, talking to community members, engaging with people one-on-one -on -one and in person. And we had set up an event that was going to be a 150 person event um, for this Easter egg hunt that they do every year annually at the community center. Um, but obviously then COVID hit and that event got canceled. Um, and so what we had to do was pivot to online engagement. And so of course that's very, very different. But what I ended up doing was creating an online poll for people in the community to give feedback on what community means to them and um, give examples of, of a vibrant community. So I actually got a lot of um, online responses, which was super helpful. People would say, um, you know, having coffee with a friend, sending like a love letter or a snail mail and so I took all those different suggestions and I depicted those scenes and those acts of kindness um, using these little insect characters that I made up. Cause I thought it'd be really cute to do like a Bugs Life type of um, mural. So here's a detail shot of that. And of course, during this time, um, the city of Richmond was super helpful in putting out like safety procedures and like barriers to make sure everything was like COVID friendly and that it was like a safe work environment. Here's some details there. And going back to the personal touch thing, I feel like it's really important to, to have like little details um, that really set your work apart, I guess, from other people or just really make it your own. So for me, I saw these like big giant rocks here that were just gray boulders. And I thought um, I wanted to incorporate them into the mural and kind of have the mural lead into the playground using these rocks as markers. So I asked the city if I could like paint these rocks and they came back really quickly and said, yes. <laughs> and this is why. There's painted rocks now. <laughs> it was just an extra little something. And also another note is that big sun up top. I wasn't actually um, supposed to go up there and paint that or it wasn't part of the project. I was just commissioned to paint the bottom part but I thought the sun would just add something extra and a pop of color that people could see from far away. So again, I asked for permission to do that extra little touch. And a couple more things about adapting during this time. Um, what you could do is promote custom work and special deals. So for example, like with my greeting cards, I have like a buy four, get one free deal. Um, just little things like that to remind people um, of your work. You could also create postcard sets and snail mail since people can't really see their loved ones right now. So it's nice to give them something, you know, something thoughtful in the mail. You could try collaboration or giveaway. Um, so I've done collaborations with people before, like other local companies. And so it's a nice way to just um, 
share the love and also promote local businesses and have their followers on Instagram be your followers and vice versa. So sometimes that works. And the last thing um, is offer a digital service because everything is kind of moving online now, even for old grandmas like me who are not technologically savvy, it's important to try to find different avenues um, to keep up with the times. <laughs> um, so that's the um, last thing I wanna talk about is um, during the beginning of COVID, I actually basically like lost a lot of um, my main sources of income like with the greeting cards, because of course, a lot of the shops were closing down temporarily or just, you know, of course the pandemic was affecting everyone. And so with not a lot of card orders coming in and I wasn't really promoting it much either, to be honest, um, I decided to try a passion project that I had been thinking about for a really long time and just had never done. And it was a digital service um, that I was, um, intending to offer. So I wanted to call it Instant Cup Doodles, and it was based on an illustration I did back in 2013, long, long time ago. Um, so you can see how old that one is. And then I revamped it into the 2019 version. And so this service that I thought up was um, something I'd been wanting to offer for a long time because with the murals, I think it's um, I usually work with companies and it's not really at a price point, I guess, that a lot of, you know, people, um, can really afford. So I decided to make an affordable service called Instant Cup Doodles, where I would create digital doodles for people. And so I made this website during the pandemic. Here are some examples of doodles. So you can see I offered at the beginning different packages. So there were like more affordable, cheaper packages where it would just be like a one word doodle and you can send me a word like mountain and then I would draw it in my style. And then there were also, you know, um, another package where you could get your pet drawn or your family. And then there was like the third package which was like custom doodles which was like super personalized and much more detailed. So I had like three different tiers that I would offer people. And at first I thought, you know, I was just gonna get like maybe one or two illustrations. I wasn't really thinking that, um, I wasn't really thinking actually, I just kind of made this. But um, I was really grateful that the, the week I launched it, um, I got a lot of doodles, like I think, over a hundred in the first two days, which was kind of insane. And I had said my turnaround time was like 48 hours. So basically those two days, I ended up illustrating like 16 hours a day just to like get them out. Um, and then after that, I learned from the mistake of making my turnaround time way too early. And then I kind of changed up the business model but yeah, it's a lot of trial and error and just basically learning along the way, learning from mistakes, learning from past projects to hone in and build something that really works. And that is something that if you're wanting to become an artist, like that's something you have to figure out for yourself in a way, but it's basically trying, trying, trying and trying again. And I wanted to end with this um, painting that I did for myself a while ago because I love Lord of the Rings, <laughs> but um, it's also just symbolic of just continually learning. And this piece I did just for myself, not for anyone else, just because I wanted to practice lighting and practice using watercolor. And um, yeah, it just kind of symbolizes a lifelong learning journey for me. And that's basically what, um, art is, art is life. <laughs> so there you go. Um, here are some of the places where you can find my art. So mostly it's on Instagram. And 
if you want cards and prints, I have a website for that. And also another website that I don't really update that no one really knows about, <laughs> but there you go. So thanks for watching this presentation. And now I think I'm gonna turn it to Kathy um, if there are any questions. Thanks, Laura, that's great. Um, there were a lot of questions going through, so um, I'm just gonna go through them kind of in the order I got them in. And if I miss anything um, in the chat, uh, I'll try to get to them all, <laughs> basically. Um, so first was a question um, from Tommy on Facebook um, a week ago. So we'll start with that one. Um, so Tommy was wondering just how um, did you manage to develop your following of 13,000 followers or more um, on Instagram? How long did it take um, and does this contribute to your business? That's a good question. Um, so I think I mentioned before that, yeah, I started in 2015, I think, kind of around the same time that I quit my job and had those four months off to kind of figure things out for myself. Um, so yeah, I really started with no plan, just posting, you know, drawings and paintings that I was doing. Um, but also, I think the local shows helped a lot, um, like Make It Vancouver, Got Craft, the ones I was doing because um, people would see me at the shows and then I would have like my Instagram there so that people could know where to find me and um, where, you know, to see my art. Um, so that was helpful as well. And then also um, I think I did more like collaborations at the beginning where I would work with like local, like I worked with one lady who made um, paper flowers in Utah, which was really cool. And so I connected with her and then we did a little giveaway and that helps too, because um, a lot of my followers are local, but um, if you collaborate with people from all around the world, because the internet is so amazing and connects so many people, then you get followers or people from different parts of the world as well. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers it. But really, honestly, I'm not the best person to ask because um, I post really randomly. I don't look at the algorithms and stuff like that. But I can definitely recommend people, like a lot of my friends who are like social media gurus who know that stuff. And it's helpful to have people like that if you are interested. Mm -hmm. Well, 13,000 followers is nothing to sneeze at. So <laughs> you must be doing something right. Um, another question from Tommy was, how do you network and meet clients um, in Vancouver in particular, since we're mostly artists from the lower mainland here? Right. Um, Again, to be honest, I'm not great at networking. Like I don't know a lot of fellow artists, um, as many as I would like, I think. Um, but I think Rive was helpful, um, that, that um, group that I was mentioning before, because at least I got to meet, you know, artists who work and live in Vancouver as well. And that was helpful to just connect and have a sense of community and also people I met from local art shows. Um, it's just, you know, putting yourself out there and like making friends with those people, I think is really helpful because then you have people, if you're not sure about something, then you can ask them. And um, that, um, on that note, I actually had a studio last year with two jewelers and those two girls I met at these art shows and we ended up you know, sharing a studio together for a year. And that was really helpful because um, I got to know them on a much more personal level and we got to help each other out um, because even though they weren't doing exactly what I was doing, we were all doing creative work and it was helpful to have that environment. Yeah, for sure. And for those of you who don't know um, Thrive Art Studios, uh, it's a local group that's been going for quite some time and they have moved online. So if you are interested, definitely look them up. Um, question from Beatrice, have you copyrighted any of your artwork? Um, you know, is that a concern? Because, you know, once your work is online, anyone can grab it and use it. So how, how do you protect your work or do you just not worry about that? Yeah, to be honest, um, I don't worry about it. I just, my mentality is just, um, 
just keep going. Like, I know what I do is my stuff. So like, you can't really do anything, unfortunately. Um, and I came to that mentality because like in the past I have been copied before. Like there are a lot of examples of that. Um, like sometimes people will show me like, hey, like you sell an AliExpress, like there's cell phone cases with your art on it. I'm like, no, I don't. Like that wasn't a collaboration. That was just someone ripping it off. Or like, I think the biggest was like, I don't think I've ever mentioned this online or anything, but like, well, maybe. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, like a, a couple of years ago, yeah. um, like something super, like I had created a penguin that had like little stars in the tummy and it was very specific. Um, and then um, someone showed me a picture online of like a very, very similar pajama set that they were selling. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, stuff like that. Like you can't really do anything, unfortunately, because even people I've talked to who have had their stuff copied and, you know, went the route of getting lawyers and going through that whole court system of trying to like, um, yeah, just fight for their work. Like it's a, it's a headache and I'm just not good with paperwork. So personally, I, I just can't do it. Yeah. I, I <laughs> Move know. On. I, yeah. I've heard it's a very, very long process too. And, yeah. and no guarantees. I mean, it's an unfortunate side effect of the internet. Um, exactly. But I think, I do think though, it's true once people know you and people know your style. Um, it's, you know, as long as you kind of have your followers and stuff, um, people will kind of know what you, what you're doing. And, um, cause yeah. it's, especially if it's a company that you, they know you would never have anything to do with, mm -hmm. um, you know, they would recognize that. Mm -hmm. Um, other question from Beatrice, uh, when doing illustrations for a company, what is your quota? For example, are you working hourly or per project? Um, so yeah, every project is different. So, um, quoting when I quote a client, um, it is kind of like, I, I do have an hourly rate, but, um, it really depends on the project too. I try to make something that's fair for me to make sure that, you know, I'm not working for pennies, but also fair for the client. Um, and so yeah, it's, I do have an hourly rate, but um, I kind of gauge like what also is the market value of that certain piece. Hope that answers it. Yeah, I think so. A <laughs> uh, question from Leticia. Uh, can we see some of your murals around town? Like, where are they? How can we find out more about your murals? Yeah, um, so the one, um, the, the flowers in her hair one, that was um, giving gifts. So that's on Main Street. Um, I don't know the exact address right now, but um, I think it's Main and 30th, somewhere yep. near there. Yep, I was just there, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, sweet. Yeah. Um, and also um, the late bloomer one is, you can find it on the Vancouver Mural Festival app as well. It's um, behind Strath Strathcona Beer Company. So that one's East Hastings, 895 East Hastings. Um, and then the... Uh, the most recent one um, for the city of Richmond, that was West Richmond Community Center. Um, yeah, I think those are the three big ones that I can think of right now. <laughs> the, the, a lot of them were residences, right? So Yeah, some of them are residential. So like they're in private buildings. Um, oh yeah, there's another one, the octopus or the squid one, sorry squid octopus the squid one is at fishworks restaurant in north vancouver all right thank you um beatrice is asking and this goes back to one of your tips about being rejected um, and asking for feedback uh, are you worried that if you ask for feedback that they can take it the wrong way um i guess it depends on how you ask i think um Sometimes, like with the Richmond call, I remember they even said in the email, like, if you have any questions about how this decision was made, uh, contact us. So that was actually nice because then I called them up and I was like, hey, like, can you give me a little bit more about what you were looking for? What was the process in choosing the artist? 
So I think in that sense, um, that particular one, they were open to asking for feedback. Of course, you wanna gauge the situation. You don't wanna just keep going to like past clients and being like, hey, why didn't you hire me? Like, why? You don't wanna be desperate, obviously, but um, just kind of gauge and see if people are open to giving feedback. And I think um, it's for your learning opportunity anyways, right? So um, just whatever you feel comfortable with asking. And speaking from a gallery point of view and someone who also writes grants, um, granting bodies always welcome questions um, as to why you didn't receive a grant. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of galleries will as well. Um, I would think most people working in the arts really want to help artists and, you know, want, I know, I know in particular for Richmond Public Art, like they're really trying to build up a base of artists. Totally. So, you know, the more artists that they can help to kind of, because it is a big process, it is a big application form, um, you know, any way that they can kind of help get the artists work out there and working with them again, they're going to want to do it. And I know the same goes for, in particular, I'm thinking of places that do art rental, um, you know, it's their business, they want to work with artists. So if they do reject you, yes, I do highly recommend asking politely, <laughs> you know, even if it's just in an email, you know, can you give me some tips on how I can improve my application next time? Um, Teresa's asking more specific to murals. Um, who pays for the paint when you do a mural? Um, so it depends on the project. Um, so if it's for like a private client, usually I put that into my quote. Um, so that's part of like uh, the package I give them. I I say that I'm in charge of all the paints and supplies, um, like paint brushes and stuff like that. Um, for certain artist calls, like for example, the Vancouver Mural Festival one I did, that one they had like an honorarium or a budget for paint already. So yeah. Great, um, another one from, from Beatrice. Uh, do you think it's possible to have an art business without social media? Um, I think so. I mean, I hope so. Because honestly, as much as like, I'm super, obviously, I'm super grateful for everyone on social media. But social media for me is like a love hate thing. Like, I post my art, but I'm actually honestly not on social media a lot. Like, I just prefer to not really have my phone on me or not have people be able to contact me. Personally, I just prefer it that way. Um, and I have to say that most of my connections have for like bigger projects have been um, through meeting people in person, like at the shows, like I was mentioning, or just having my work out there. Um, like for example, the squid mural was how I got in contact with one of the interior designers for another project because she was looking for a muralist and um, she was like, where would I find such a person? And she just happened to be at that restaurant and looked up, saw the squid and my info was on there and so that's how she got in contact with me um so i think it's just like keep producing work and um having it out in the actual world not the online world is super important great um a question from victor uh, what is the most difficult part of being an artist for you what do you struggle with uh definitely the admin work part like when I became an artist, I didn't realize that like 50% of it is like business work and um, creating invoices, quoting clients, making sure I'm on top of like all different things, sending packages out on time, um, taxes. Like it's just so much paperwork um, that I really have to make time and set goals for myself to make sure I'm drawing and creating every day. So that I don't, I don't lose that, like the essence of my um, art practice. <laughs> Which leads into um, another question from Chris. Um, Thanks for sharing your artistic journey and inspirations for your business. But do you ever find it difficult to create new material? Like, what is a process for working through a creative lull? That's a good um, question. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think all artists go through creative block. It'd be kind of insane for someone to just produce, 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 and 
you know, creativity isn't just like this like thing that kind of like leaks and oozes out all the time. Like, so um, sometimes I need to step back and just take a break um, and put my mind in a different mindset and just not even think about making things for work or art like purposes. Um, sorry, that's kind of like convoluted, but um, for example, I play music as well. So sometimes um, when I feel especially like, like I don't even want to be drawing, I will pick up a guitar or I will play music and that's like a it's still creative, but it's a different outlet and it's therapeutic for me and it's for myself instead of creating for other people. And I think there always has to be that balance of like producing commercial work that makes other people happy and then making things that make me happy. Great. Great. Um, comment from Jean. I uh, love your focus on sustainability. What are your recommendations for sustainable packaging if you have any product suggestions? Um, yeah, so I don't mind sharing because like uh, I had researched a bunch like when I first started and I think um, the one that I found that works for me like is clearbags.ca, which is a Canadian company and they offer um, plastic plastic. I actually don't really know it. Like they're, I think they're called eco-friendly on their website, but basically it's like the material that can be uh, biodegradable. Um, and you can definitely feel the difference in it. Cause I did start out with like plastic sleeves at the very beginning and they're like more durable, but like, I, I don't really care. Like these new ones do the job and like, they feel a little bit different, but like, obviously better for the environment. So no brainer for me. Great, thanks. Um, Crystal is asking, what is your favorite project that you've done? Hmm. <laughs> I think Late Bloomer was a really like personal one for me. That mural I did with like the two, like the bunny and like the cat meeting together with all the florals. I like anything with florals. So I think, um, yeah, that's probably one of my favorites so far. But um, I think looking at old work always like freaks me out. So I think usually I'm like super excited about the current project. And then once that's done, then I move on and it's like always continuing. So usually I'm most excited about like the current thing I'm working on. <laughs> Well, I think that's a great way to end. I think we've answered pretty much all the questions in the chat. Um, a lot of thank yous for an inspirational talk, Laura. So thank you so much for uh, all, all, this, all the info you shared with us and, and just sharing your journey with us. Um, so I do want to thank um, all the participants out there. Thank you for joining us. This is our last uh, session for 2020. Uh, we'll be taking a few months break and hope to be back in February 2021. Um, so I, I really appreciate all of the participants who've uh, been with me for the past few years with the Artist Salon program. Thank you for following me online. Um, and I want to thank, you know, all the presenters that have been a part of this as well. A special shout out to Melanie, who's been behind the scenes with me this entire time, who has taught me Zoom and <laughs> helped with all our technical difficulties and issues. I uh, couldn't have done it without her. So thank you, Melanie, for everything you've done. Um, in, in, in sort of part two of that, uh, Melanie has created um, all of these live streams as videos. She edits them all for me. And we now have a fabulous resource for the Artist Salon um, on our website and on our YouTube channel. So please check that out. Um, I want to, again, just say thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a really good rest of the year, a good winter, stay safe, and hopefully we will see you in person, maybe, uh, next year. And again, thanks, Laura, for all you've done and for sharing with us tonight, and good night, everybody. We hope to see you in 2021.